recorded. So we would be forwarding you the recording and the presentation at the end of the event. Good morning and good evening, and welcome to this session of Mobilis Design's webinar on accurate and rapid modeling of automotive networks and gateways. I'm your host, Deepak Shankar. I'm the founder of Nervous Design. And in the next 50 minutes, I'm going to walk you through the capabilities and requirements of designing automotive networks and gateways. Now, I'm going to start off with a traditional approach and then go into what's needed for the new generation of requirements. And at the same time, look at application examples, the methodologies, and providing some of the experiments. If you look at the traditional auto networks, you had like a single protocol, maybe a CAN network or a LIN network with a single gateway, and you connected all the different devices across this gateway. You might have had a few bridges that connected all your CAN networks. And you're primarily interested in looking at the network latencies from, say, a sensor to the ECU and the throughput across all the scan networks. The main purpose of doing this was to assign sensors and ECUs to the different say, network segments. And for doing that, you needed to be able to provide a proper routing table for both signal and uh, message transfers. And as such, also come up with what's the network capacity, because some of them may even be CAN FE type uh, architectures. Now, the new generation of technology is no longer limited to a single protocol. Now, you have protocols that are within the net car or vehicle, and then there are protocols that are outside of the vehicle. So within the vehicle, you might have Ethernet, CAN, X-ray, and a whole suite of them. But outside, you also have a whole lot of them, including Bluetooth, NFCs, uh, you know, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, V2V, and a host of other uh, protocols that are required to handle things such as, you know, getting cloud services, uh, being able to handle autonomous driving, uh, handle like software updates, things like that. Um, nowadays, even like handling, connecting to your home network is a requirement. And of course, last but not least, infotainment and safety requirements are also required that need to communicate to data center for access to data, or even to be able to do artificial intelligence process. Now, autonomous driving is an interesting aspect because not only do you need the sensor data that needs to be processed locally, but you also need to access certain artificial intelligence information and data handling from the cloud, in addition to uh, responses or requests or even uh, triggers that come from say other vehicles or on the pavement or you know or data coming in from uh, you know traffic infrastructures that might be set up by the uh, local authorities now in addition to all of this on top of all of these are services such as evaluating ai algorithm for cyber security uh, failure detection and of course now with over 150 uh, ecus in a vehicle really the dynamic allocation of crossing and storage. So rather than always a one-to-one -one mapping, you can have the flexibility where if some parts of the network are busy and some parts are not, you could potentially transfer some of the processing over to this other part of it and be able to handle the workload, truly distributing it across the network. Now, there are also new types of gateways, security gateway to separate out the wireless and the wired system. Is, is a new functionality that's available within the base. So as you can see, the new generation requires a completely different view when it comes to auto network. The old methodology no longer applies. So what does that really mean? There are two aspects that come to mind immediately. First and foremost is you need to get rid of all the wiring bait. The second is supporting high-speed data. Support high-speed data, you have to move to time-sensitive networking and handle the time-critical data at the gate. Now, where does Visual Sync come in? It allows you to do estimates of things like time slots, credit information, other system definitions, such as buffers and things like that. But also, 
you want to observe the deterministic and non-deterministic behavior of time critical applications. So anything from uh, control data transmission on a time slot to like class A, class B and best effort on the ethernet to TAN to an ethernet uh, packing, unpacking of the signals and messages. Now, how does this work within visual? So let's take a gateway model, for example. First and foremost is to take the gateway model from the library, which is a TSN library in this particular case. You drag and drop the component into the system. And here we have the Ethernet node. Each block within Visual Sim has a unique set of parameters. So in this case, we're looking at the Ethernet node, which now obviously means that you're going to have clock speeds, data maximum, data sizes, but also, in this case, class A, class B information or idle slope, sense slope. Also, guard band, the uh, percentage of class A and B things, you know, and other attributes that, that are used to configure a real automotive network. So, these will be parameters in the components or library blocks that are available for you to construct your entire network. Now, let's take the statistics and experiments that you would perform in an auto network. First and foremost, let's start with the statistics. The most popular stats are really latency, the impact of your credit, and the buffer occupancy. So buffer occupancy is fairly simple. You have uh, different types of buffers allocated for different types of data. So you have the CDT, class A, class B, and the best effort, the eight uh, type of service. Now, idle slope, sense slope are really based on the uh, Availability, in, if you look at the previous slide, we had the high for the idle slope of class A was about 8,000, which is really what you're seeing as your peak right over here. Now, another aspect is your uh, time slot. In this case, we've got two time slots, one with two milliseconds, the other with eight milliseconds, and they have maximum data. And you can see who has been allocated each one of them. So you can see that, that slot one only has this control data, while uh, slot two has ABD and best effort because you also have the guard band. So really, if you look at the round trip uh, latency to you know come back onto the next uh, uh, repeat cycle would be about ten plus uh, ten milliseconds plus five hundred microseconds nanoseconds. Now, if you just focus on the latency, what you would notice is there are three graphics. One is related to the phone data. Second is audio video printing, and third is the best effort, which is a uh, Ethernet. Now, obviously, what you notice is at the start here of every cycle, so you have zero, and then you have the uh, two milliseconds of your slot one, and then uh, the remaining eight milliseconds. So notice most of the spike is happening right at the beginning of that, uh, of that slot. The reason is your you know, if the data came in at zero, but then you can only start transmitting at two, you already had a two millisecond delay. So the selection of those time slots, and of course other things like the high and low credit and things like that, the, uh, those are really what is going to determine whether you're going to have your deterministic, non-deterministic type traffic. So something that is very important to consider when you're looking is that every one of those attribute changes or impacts you make has a direct consequence on your latency and on your truth. Now, let's take a scenario like this where you're creating your bandwidth, your MIF, your, uh, your time uh, aware shaping, your credits, all of those. And we're trying to create a worst case scenario. What's a worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is where your control data is no longer deterministic and it goes comes out of the slot. So if you look right over here, you're going to notice is that right after this, the next one doesn't show up in the right slot. It should be showing up here. It doesn't shows up much later. So what's happening there in what is happening here is that your control data is no longer in the predictable state, but has been shifted by about nine milliseconds. So actually, sorry, a little more than nine, probably 10 milliseconds, which is the, uh, the total repeat cycle. So which means it missed its slot, has to wait until the next slot. And 
if we have to make sure, especially for control data, because those are safety critical situations, so you have to make sure that you, you're able to meet them. But in this situation, with this configuration, you've created the worst case scenario. Now, now that you've seen kind of the basics of what happens on the network, let's take an application example. We'll start off with just the network and then we'll expand the capacity. First and foremost, we take a network which has got multiple ECUs connected to individual CAN buses, goes across two gateways to other CANs, and there's Ethernet uh, between them. One of the goals here is we're looking at things like safety and braking, where predictability of delay is very, very critical. So you have, these are time critical applications. Now, what are the challenges here? The challenges are the specific things about time aware shaping, the uh, you know, looking at ensuring that the CDT frames never have a delay. So when they come in immediately, they get to go into their time slots. And of course, looking at the high credit, low credit, idle uh, and uh, sense slope, looking at all of these specifications for those. And of course, there are physical ones like the buffer of overflow, the interval frame between the slots, things like that. So you're now looking at where you have multiple protocols, you have gateways, and you're trying to configure different attributes of the system. So if you saw those examples, we showed you what the statistics were, now we're showing you what is needed to construct the model. So here, for example, the same network, and you saw these were all the different types of statistics, but we also added another one, which is we're going beyond just doing the network. We're now starting to look at attributes of the hardware. In this particular case, the power. Now, obviously, we'll also be looking at software, which will come a little bit further down, but we just incorporated the power here, which will demonstrate the impact on the hardware itself. Of course, we're looking at buffer occupancy, we're looking at the frame latencies right at the CAN bus point. And the goal is to really analyze the response time. What is the TSN slot specification? And what is the latency associated with those? And where are we seeing the buffering? Matter of fact, if you look at these, the buffering hits 300 packets which means during that two milliseconds, or maybe including the guard band of the previous slot, uh, you're looking at about 300 packets being buffered before the slot for class A and B become available and they're sent out. So what's your natural instinct tell you is that, hey, let me go ahead and make these, uh, the first slot to be really small so that I have lesser amount of latency and I can send it. So I'll start looking at the frame latency, the buffer and the sense. Now, this is a visual sim model of a system. What you see over here are your individual networks. You can see your Ethernet uh, switches and then the gateways. Now, one of the things that is done is that once you build a model, your goal is to try to configure the model with as many variations as possible. The reason is twofold. One is you may have existing traffic traces that you want to import into the system. So when you do those, you want to study what happens when you make changes to your network based on existing data. The second is to try to create synthetic data that emulates these existing functionality and also the new functionality, and then see what happens for the different configurations. Now, one of the problems that a lot of times you have is you might get information about the network. So you'd be able to put a wire shark or something like that, and you would know what the network latency is, what the network throughput is, you know, what's your credit at the network, things like that. But what you are missing is what is the impact of the hardware and software decisions? So, for example, if I put in a slower processor on my uh, network, on my uh, ECU, on my gateway ECU, how does that impact the throughput across that gateway? Um, there are not just the routing that you're looking at, you're looking at the proxy, you're looking at the packing, unpacking, scheduling, so many different things, and they all get impacted by the hardware in the ECU. So it's not just the network protocols. So, Let's take a system that, that looks like this. We're still on the network. Later on, we're going to move the hardware and software. 
So here what we have is we've got a CAN network and it's got, uh, you know, five CAN, I'm sorry, uh, a gateway with five CAN and two Ethernet interfaces. The Ethernet component is made up of these different, actually 11 different uh, uh, variations based on priority and each of them have a gate. So depending on the time slots like we allocated earlier on as you saw on the previous slides, and based on the attributes, for example, here the megabytes allocated to each one, the guard band, the uh, you know the high low policy. We talked about that as well, um, and then of course, what's a general policy right over here? So based on these, we determine what is the best configuration of the slots. And also, if I vary these parameters, how does that impact my latency? How does that impact my throughput? So this is part of the underlying details of what's inside a gateway. So we took the gateway block that we looked earlier that we dragged and dropped from the system, from the library. You can now see what's inside of that gateway. So at every interface, Ethernet interface, this will be the configuration that's built into it. Now, let's look at the baseline specification of the system. So what we have over here is we have an allocation of 10 millisecond and 500 microsecond, nanoseconds, out of which two goes for CDG, eight for audio video bridging, and 500 gigabits, for, I'm sorry, 500 nanoseconds for the guard band. So what happens here? If you look back earlier, this is what we were talking about, where, you know, because I had to wait until the T2, slot T2, I start piling up all of these different, uh, you know, filling up these different buffers. So as a result of which, when the request comes along to actually move into slot two, very quickly, we see that the credit which was built up during that slot one, uh, you know, not being able to transmit any class A, class B, you see the credit build up and very quickly we start seeing the drops and the changes. So the reason you're seeing these things go up and down is because you will have like here, for example, you might have best effort, A, B, B, B. So these are B. So in this case, if you look at the class A, it starts recouping some of its credit. So it started transmitting and then there's no more credit. So then it starts rebuilding and keeps to go up again up to the maximum point of 8,000. So notice in between, we never get to 8,000. Maybe we get to 6,500, but never to 8,000. This is because, you know, by the time we get there, there's already class A packets. We start transmitting them immediately. So as soon as they come, we send them out immediately. Now, that was the best case scenario. Now let's take the worst case scenario, which in this particular case is, we provide the CDT with 700 microseconds, and you know we start the same drop going right across, but now what has changed is that we start off here at zero, no problem. The CDD packet goes across, but when we come here to the 52, the CDD frame has not been able to arrive because there's a lot of congestion at the rest of the system. As a result of which, the CDD arrives earlier but it does not become available through this process. So this is what you see here, that we had almost a two millisecond latency for the, uh, uh, for the CDT. But of course, the other ones, this is interesting, the class A, class B, actually in this case, the class A, notice here, which is the A over here, it really goes up to 160 buffers. So earlier on, we had 300, now we're down to 160. So does that mean these 700 microseconds is okay? We should keep them or should we consider that, okay, the, you know, maybe the thing is we shift this, uh, the CDD to some other locations in the, in the flow or maybe increase the number of slots, give more slots to AVB, but at the same time, provide the CDT with the slots in a pr appropriate location. So based on the traffic, in this case, the wire shop traffic is coming in from a real network and combined with AR, XML, and uh, traces that you've captured from your data itself, and run that through the model, and then you keep varying these different uh, time shaping, different uh, you know algorithms, the different time slots, the lift uh, interval time, all of those kind of things you keep changing to come up with 
what's the optimal configuration. In this particular case, we know that because it's going up here, it's missing the plug, it's inappropriate, so we're gonna find some other scenario. Now, when we start exploring, and this is what we just saw, the baseline was 10, well, then we tried one with 8.7 milliseconds. And you can see that's where you notice here, the 700 microseconds. But what do we find? We found that, you know, with the two milliseconds and eight milliseconds is what really worked. The worst case scenario completely failed because the CDT packets were not able to get through it and it had to wait till the whole cycle had to be repeated. Now, one of the problems with most networking is that it only focuses on the protocol. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more to an uh, automotive network than just the protocols. You have the sensors, you have your hardware, which is the brake ECU, you have the operating system, the software. There's so many aspects that go inside these uh, vehicles. And that includes not just the, you know, the e-brake ECU or other types of ECUs, but also the gateway is a type of ECU. So, you know, if I have like say the routing or the packing or unpacking or scheduling or forwarding, all of those are going to run as a processor. They require a certain amount of memory. All of these attributes, maybe a DMA, maybe buses, has all of those requirements. Now, to be able to handle those requirements, the gateway must be uh, must be fast enough. So should it be single core, multi-core? Should it, you know, like be a 200 megahertz or an 800 megahertz processor? What should it be? So what we do is we create the same network model, no difference. We start incorporating the different sensors. And then the, for the ECUs, we start including the actual hardware model. So this would include the processors, the memory, the buses, the caches, the uh, DMAs, all of those attributes would get included into the breakings. So what's happened now? We started with the network, we added the gateway, and now we're starting to add the hardware to the system. And this is gonna give us a much better representation of what the expected latency and expected throughput are gonna be. Now, when you look at the hardware, the results are gonna be completely different. So if you remember the earlier one, we only focused on the throughput, the latency, the buffer occupancy, and the credit. Now here, we're starting to look at speed, power. We're still looking at latency. We're still looking at correctness, but the latency is for a completely different purpose. So it's not just that uh, the, uh, it's not just the uh, you know the uh, latency across a, across say a CAN segment or an Ethernet segment, but rather it's the end to end from the time the proximity sensor or the brake pedal is applied to going through all the processing, all the data has to arrive to the point where it actually transmits over to the uh, wheel sensor. So if you notice one of the things here, the front wheels are all at about 200 microseconds, but the, rear, the uh, rear wheels are all at between 300 and 400 microseconds. Fairly large range is what you're seeing right over there. So this assures me that either there's a problem on the ECU, so either it could be the operating system taking too long or the, the data is waiting in the ECU for processing, all the data hasn't arrived across the network. So it could be a network problem, could be a hardware problem, or it could be a software problem. So identifying where the problem is, is a major portion of your analysis. So now that you've seen the basic aspect of a gateway, a basic aspect of the ECU, now let's move on to looking at the innovations that also go into adding uh, details within your network simulation. So what is it? The first is looking at the systems engineering process. So one of the things that you have to look at is a lot of people say, oh yeah, I can just use an open source uh, network simulator and I can get my work done. Not really, because you have to model a lot of details. We're not just talking about the TSN, Ethernet and uh, the CAN and the LIN and the flex ray, but also you have to model the uh, 
gateway underlying details like the hardware, software. You have to model the writing tables. You also have to start looking at artificial intelligence algorithms for like dynamic routing or for distributed denial of service, uh, intrusion prevention, or the big one now, autonomous driving. So what happens now is you have to start looking at providing a network systems engineering process that goes beyond just a protocol level model. And also the tests that you run through the system, they also play a major role in your particular evaluation. So it's no longer just bringing in trace data or bringing in data from an AR XML to configure the system, but rather you're putting it all together using a combination of those, or maybe all of those, and then running test cases, which are essentially, you know, what are the kind of uh, specific impacts that are having on the system. Now, the goal of any of these things, whether it's the CDP, the class A, setting up the hardware platform, is really is the application finishing the work on time, so the breaking. From the time the proximity sensor said, you got a break, the time it actually breaking uh, was applied, uh, the pressure was applied on the, on the uh, uh, wheel, how long did it take? So if you look at this particular case, the T3 was expected to complete right around here. But in reality, it finished right over here. And if you look at this timing diagram plot, you can very easily see that there were higher priority T1 and T2s that are arrived. And they had, be, had to be processed first before the T3 could go. That's where the time aware shaping comes in. So for T3, if it had to complete the time, what you had to do was add another slot and T3 would be given uh, highest priority. Or it could be that you can make this uh, software where you know, T3 gets uh, a, a mutex, for example. So a mutual exclusion, which means even the higher priority tasks are there, it cannot get preempted, like how it's gotten preempted over here and here, but the software can actually run through uh, without being interrupted. So which means that the software would have completed the processing before it got uh, preempted and it'll be able to finish it within the time schedule. Now, one of the other aspects when you look at the system is really a failure analysis. So. There's a variety of failures that we at uh, Mirabless Design have researched and worked towards and provided as part of the tool. So they can be a node failure, they can be a connectivity failure, they can be dependency failures. So, you know, I'm expected to finish my work in Proso uh, 1 and then go over to ECU 2, but Proso 1 is too busy, so ECU 2 cannot start the process. So that's a form of failure as well. But here, for example, shows you all the possible standard network failures that are shipped with Visual Studio. So if you have a design, you could apply all of these. Now, if you look back at the network failure, you can see the failure without resolution, which means there is uh, you know, uh, no errors uh, occurring. You can see the upper chart where the red flow is the flow one and blue flow is the flow two. Now, the congestion itself or the failure is happening in node two, which is probably a form of a date loop. So you have a node two. So, but I had the clean state with no resolution. I got this, but I added the resolution to the failure, which means, you know, when the condition occurred, some sort of a credit was set up and some sort of blocking was done in terms of the gate. As a result of this, you can see what the impact is on the latency itself. So what happened in the design as a result of this particular uh, kind of intrusion or, uh, or some sort of a you know, denial of service that occur. Now, a major portion of, the re of today's research is centered on cybersecurity. And cybersecurity has gotten so complex, it's almost impossible to do it without artificial intelligence algorithms. So you really need recursive and also the artificial intelligence with sufficient amount of data to be able to test the algorithm on. Now, today, most of the current tool testing is limited to the correctness of the algorithm relative to some sort of the uh, standard set of tests that are provided. 
What really has to happen now is you have to expand that testing to evaluate the real network, which means you know, you're going to be putting it on a real network, putting it on real hardware, bringing in real data across the network, and you want to evaluate the quality. How do you evaluate the quality? Obviously, is there any overhead created as a result of which the throughput goes down? How long does it take for the, uh, for the particular AI algorithm to uh, react when there is a distribution denial of service? Now, how does this algorithm, which is running alongside, say, packing, unpacking, or routing, or forwarding, how does it impact the overall network throughput? Because it's going to hold back some of the other data. How is it going to handle that? So that's cybersecurity for you in the sense that you want to make sure that, you know, the, uh, just because you added cybersecurity doesn't mean your whole network drops by 40% capacity, but rather it's being set up in a way where it's efficient and it's within the response time period that's required for the data. Now, you see the network, you see the hardware, you saw the artificial intelligence and the mapping of the cybersecurity algorithms onto the hardware platform. Now, let's take it a step further, which is your network doesn't just have the hardware, it also has software. Only if you have the software, you can actually run or do something actively in it. No, it's just a static box or it's a completely mechanical vehicle. Now, then you look at the system here, uh, any algorithm gets split into two parts. One part is the physical structure, which is your network, your ECUs, your gateways, things like that. The other part is the logical part, which is all the tasks. You can say, oh yeah, this is all software, but it could actually be that eventually it might go on to an FPGA, so it might be completely in hardware. But really the question comes up is, how do you map all of these different functions onto the different ECUs? Now, why is that relevant? The reason it's relevant is now with autonomous driving, with artificial intelligence algorithms and things like that, it's no longer restricted to where you're only doing the hardware or you're only doing software or you're only doing network. The allocation of these different functions onto the different ECUs will have a significant impact on the network because now you're no longer just transmitting the uh, small CAN data sizes, you're transmitting now megabytes or even gigabytes of video data. So it's really transforming how your network behaves, what happens on your real network. So if you looked at the mapping earlier of the uh, autonomous driving algorithms, what we've done now is we've created the algorithm to where you have the, uh, the simple uh, connectivity between them, so A dash one triggers two and three, and the three has to wait until two is done before it can be triggered. And each one of them gets mapped to one of the six ECUs right over here. Each of the ECUs has their own processing. The whole idea here is to try to do different types of mapping and then figure out which one is the most efficient, which one is going to get us the best return. Now, if you take this a, a little bit further, not only are you integrating a model of your software, your hardware, but also in between, you're integrating the operating system. It could be RSR or it could be QNX, so it could be any other operating system of choice. So now you're modeling the scheduling, the communication, and the other services around the uh, operating system such that you can now have models of the software Runnables mean the software instances that would run on Autosar. So you can look at those and then see what ends up happening right there. Meaning that how would you, uh, you know, how would you map these onto a hardware platform and then which runnables are allocated again to which uh, ECU. The reason that's significant as we saw earlier is that how it impacts the network, how busy that node is, and uh, you know how much the processing can be done remotely versus locally within the uh, within the vehicle itself. So, if you look at the report over here, there are two types of reports. Notice earlier on we talked about latency reports, buffer reports, uh, credit reports, things like that. 
Um, direct report has nothing to do with the ability to buy a house. It just means that uh, your, you know, the credit that you have available to transfer the data. So now, what you see over here is uh, the ready and then the ready to run. Ready just means that, you know, it's the time start has occurred and I got a trigger ready to run incorporates all the different resources that are required to get this up and running or go execute this particular function. And you can see over here, these are ranges. So it's, it's not just, you know, if it's going over this limit, it, it's a problem, but rather it goes below a limit, also it's a problem. So there's a min and max range within which you need to have certain number of these, uh, uh, of these functions being triggered in the, uh, in the plotting block which as a result of the uh, latency or you know, where the checkpoints were enabled in the correct order was accurate in the real system. So you notice we went from network to the gateway ECU, included the uh, software definition, and now we're also including the operating system. So in a sense, we created the entire system and then we run reliability or cybersecurity algorithms on top of that. We, uh, you know, we create these different uh, uh, diagnostics and, and uh, uh, failures. Uh, we bring in the, uh, the trace traffic. All of those happen within one environment. Another key aspect of your design today is very little of the processing is happening within the vehicle, especially for autonomous driving. And more and more of the data processing is happening in the cloud, which means that the car should be through 5G or uh, 4G, be able to access the processing in the data center and get a response back. So which means the question is, if you're, setting, you're the one setting up the data center, how many interfaces do I want from the car to the data center? You know, how many operating systems am I gonna run? How much of uh, hardware, which means, you know, how much of processors do I need? How much of memories, how much of solid state devices that I require? All of those get computed in this particular system. And this is important because autonomous driving, braking, uh, comfort, a lot of those have safety aspects built into it, which means that they have to finish within a certain deadline. Now, this particular case, what we have is a model where we have the, uh, you know, the ethernet, in this case, we only have talking about the ethernet with some direct connections to the gateway, which goes across another ethernet network and then heads out to the 5G interface to the data center and returns. So what's significant here? If you notice, we have the wire within the vehicle, we have the wireless connectivity, and we have the data center, all of them set up within a single model. So which means you're able to do your end-to-end -end latency calculation, end-to-end -end throughput calculation, right from a single model. Now, if you look at the results, again, what changes now? The big change is the throughput, because now I'm not just seeing throughput on a particular link, rather I'm seeing the throughput across the entire system. So in this particular case, from the time the request comes in, all the way to the data center and back, what was my throughput? So that's what you're seeing as the endpoint throughput. Of course, you can see the end-to-end -end latency. You can see other details, like you know how much of data was sent across these interfaces, things like that. In addition to that, on the data center itself, you know how many processes are required, how much storage is required. But the big thing is how many interfaces are required into the particular data center, the physical interfaces from 5G, Ethernet, and then into the processes. So it's really about trying to figure out what should be the end-to-end -end system, not just the network protocols, not just the gateway, not just the ECUs, not just the operating system or software, but also the external connectivity going all the way to the data center and coming back. Why is this important? This is important because based on this knowledge, you're going to determine is the processing going to be done in the vehicle or am I going to go to the data center and get responses back? So those have significant impact on your uh, system behavior, on the ability for you to brag that, yep, this autonomous driving is gonna have a response of, the, of 10 milliseconds as opposed to 
2.2 seconds. So this would really get an overall view even before you started the design, you can run some of these experiments at the concept stage and get feedback as to how exactly the system operates. So before we get wrapped up, I'm just gonna uh, talk a little bit about Mervis Design so you know who we are and what we do. So Mervis Design has been around for a while. We've won a numerous amount of awards. We'd be, uh, we are in a variety of industries like defense, space, semiconductor, automotive. And uh, we also have a very, very good uh, university program. Plus over 250 different products across a large segment of market have been using VisualSim for many years now. And uh, here's a range of customers that we have. Now, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. And we will be uploading the, the recording to YouTube so you can, uh, you can view them. At the same time, the pre presentation will also be shared with you so that you can uh, uh, also review it after the fact and go and contact us and have more questions answered. Now, VisualSim provides training apart from the software and the libraries and also provide the series of services. So VisualSim itself, Visual Sim is an end-to-end -end electrical engineering solution software, which means every aspect of electrical engineering can be handled. So what does that mean? It means one is we have a completely graphical environment as you can see in those models, but more importantly, provides you a large library, anything from you know, my processor, memory, buses, caches, but also ESN, CAN, LIN, uh, flex ray, uh, then of course, operating systems like AutoSAR, ability to bring in your software, add your batteries, add your power generators. But all of these are significant libraries available. And through this, you can start doing analysis like what's my response time? What's the buffer occupancy? What is the throughput? Being able to look at all of those in addition to how much is the battery consumption for a particular software tax or what is the, uh, you know, the uh, impact of a particular power manage, being able to evaluate all of that and also evaluate it in the context of ISO 26262 and other standards. Now this shows you the collection of all the library elements that are there in Visual Sim. So you, as you can see, there's a whole lot of these, uh, depending on what aspect of the system you're looking at, you would pick one of, of the others. So when I look at Visual Sim for a quick second, you can see this is the environment. This is where all the libraries are located. So you can see right there is this one. You can see the CAN buses, you can see the AutoSAR. And each one of these components has a unique set of parameters. So depending on which component you pick, it would have its own unique set. So this was the uh, CAN, this is the gateway. Every block has its own unique set. And when I click on this and say, okay, go ahead and run the simulation, what happens is it configures the system automatically either to, as you can see, a lot of databases are there for like routing definition and things like that. And of course, you, know, you can run the simulation and view a variety of statistics. So I'm just gonna move some of these here so you can see them better when once the simulation completes. So for example, here, this tells me at the end of the simulation, you know, how much of throughput am I getting, you know, at each one of these nodes, uh, at what time did it arrive at each one of these nodes, gives me all of that, gives me my gateway latencies, end-to-end uh, -end throughput, but here's the kicker. When I look at the end-to-end -end latency for this particular application, you can, uh, with this particular configuration, and most likely it's for 2023, You'll see how the latency is constantly going up. So notice there's a few of them which indicates probably these two. Because right at the bottom, they might be diagnostics only like a few bytes. And these are just going up. So these, this indicates that the bandwidth that's coming from some of the video devices, in this case, as they can see, it's the, uh, the 30 to 22 and 23 to 22. So probably 22 is the bottleneck right there that is causing this to uh, 
not be able to compete on time. So running this and uh, looking at the results, you can make inference as to what's really happening in your political system. Now, as mentioned earlier, you can see now that we have this uh, network model, which is this is inside of the vehicle. So you have the gateway units, you have the TSM, you have you know, other aspects here, which are like your workloads, which are your sensors or process. But in addition to that, I'm connecting to 5G and then to a data center. So what changes now? What really changes now is you're no longer just restricting your stuff only to the 5G network, but rather it goes to incorporate the inside and the outside of the vehicle, which is a very important aspect of system design. So, for example, when you look at this, you can see what the throughput and the gateway latencies are. You can see, you know, like what is the through the data center. How many interfaces? What was the memory used? Uh, you know, what was the uh, processing? You know, uh, on the interfaces, it gives you all of that insight, so that you can make decisions as to what my ECU configuration is going to look like. Does it need a dual core? Does it can it handle a single core? How much of memory do I need such that, or how much of caching, local caching that I need such that I never have to work extra to go get the data? I'm thinking it ensures more time dynamic distributed uh, service for your customers. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the presentation and I'm opening the floor for questions. If there's any questions, go ahead and type them up and I will respond to them immediately. If there are any questions, go ahead and type them up and we can uh, review and discuss these questions. 